What is up, woman beings? It is a wonderful day today. The sky is high. What? Our sights. <laughs> I think Kelly's high. <laughs> <laughs> I might be um, feeling very tired today. So, but we're gonna like talk about one of my favorite things, which is film. And as you all know, the Oscars are coming up, and one of the films that is nominated for Best Picture, among other things, is Promising Young Woman. And this film is directed by a female. It's got an amazing message, albeit a little twisted. And uh, yeah, we want to talk about it with you. So let's watch it and dive in. (laughs) Welcome to the Woman Being Podcast community. Where we explore thoughts and opinions. And have the freedom to change our minds. Without expectation or judgment, we will hold a safe space and support each other. As we navigate together in the form of feminine. Okay, so Promising Young Woman, directed by Emerald Fennell, or Fennell, do we know? I think it's Fennell that I've heard. Okay, she is known for her role as... Camilla Parker Bowles in The Crown. So if you watch The Crown, you're probably a fan because she's great. Mm -hmm. So she wrote and directed this film. It's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And it's the... Oh, by the way, spoilers. If you have not watched this film, either be prepared to have it spoiled or go watch it first and then listen. (laughs) Um, Yeah. It is about a woman whose um, friend was raped. And it's a revenge film where she goes and preys on mean men. What what would be the word? Like predators. Men that are, yeah. yeah. She yeah, she preys on predators um by pretending that she's drunk and incapacitated. And this is the friend of the girl who was raped, yes. not the girl who was yeah. raped. Yeah. yeah. And um pretending that she's incapacitated, bringing or not bringing these boys home, but these boys nicely come up and offer her a ride home and then end up taking her to her apartment and try to have sex to their apartment to their apartment and try to have sex with her without consent and Mm -hmm. then she you know wakes up and goes what are you doing and teaches them a little lesson so it's kind of um filmed as if it's like a thriller and there are some cases where you're not sure if she's killing these people or not Mm -hmm. Spoilers, she's not. So that's just, we can get that out of the way right now. Um, <laughs> There's lots of, like, cool imagery and, like, allusion to her killing them, though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and you don't really know for a while. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's a lot of, like, mm, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't know what just happened. They throw some hints at you. They throw, they divert you in different directions. So it's fun. Yeah. Um, so throughout the film, she is, first of all, a very depressed, like, lifeless person. She has devoted her entire life to Mm -hmm. terrorizing the patriarchy (laughs) and bringing it down one by one. Um, As a result, she doesn't have good friendships or relationships. She's dropped out of medical school. She, you know, doesn't pursue anything for herself. She just goes to work at this little coffee shop and then goes and pretends to be drunk and teach men lessons so yeah um she's kind of destroying herself in the process of like seeking justice Mm -hmm. and she meets a young man from med school who is played by Bo burnham and he comes and kind of tries to ask her out she says no um and then he makes a rude comment i forget what it is he's he says uh, oh, you were top of our class at med school. Like, why are you here? Yeah, Because yeah. he meets her at her work yeah. at a coffee shop. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then he's like, oh, no. He's like, that was really that rude was... of me. I'm so sorry. If yeah. you want to spit in my coffee, you can. But Bo Burnham's <laughs> character is kind of like the antithesis of all of these, like, drunk, praying men. Mm-hmm. In that he's very respectful. He's very kind. Mm-hmm. He respects her boundaries. He, you know. And there's one point where they do go on a date and... They're kind of walking. He's like, oh, I didn't realize we're at my apartment. Do you want to go up? And she, obviously, because of her traumatic background, is yeah. like, no, 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 no. But he yeah. immediately is like, kind of like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, d- I didn't, didn't, I didn't mean anything to, by it or yeah. whatever. And so they kind of like figure that out. So he's kind of this like really unassuming, very non-threatening character. Mm-hmm. He does, though, have a past because they both went to medical school together. He does have a past with these other medical students who were the perpetrators of raping her friend who was also in medical school at the time. Yeah. So 
And we don't really find out what happens to her friend, but it's in, it's insinuated she's no longer with us. Well, we know she's no, she's dead. Oh, for yeah. sure. By the end, we find out she, she is she definitely kills dead. Or we don't is know for sure if she, yeah, if she died by suicide. Oh. I don't think it it ever it never explicitly says. I think it talks it's about pretty her. clear that she's. It is heavily by implied, but they don't say it. Yeah, so she's got all this like secondary trauma. She's got PTSD. She's mm-hmm. like very depressed and yeah, you know, struggling. Um, yeah. And so this sort of, like, love story commences, and as a result, she starts hearing more about, like, this other world that she's kind of shut herself out of and what these med students are up to. And she starts to take a more concerted effort towards getting revenge on the people who were at fault or, you know, culpable for her friend's, like, demise. So um, so that's kind of interesting, and it sort of leads you up to a final climax. Mm Mm-hmm where um, she confronts the rapist at his bachelor party. Mm-hmm. And he, she, she goes in pretending to be a stripper mm-hmm. to the soundtrack of Toxic. Well, by a slow violin. Yeah. It's amazing. Or cello. Yeah. And um, this is Britney Spears' song, Toxic, um, in case anyone didn't know. Kind of the culmination of this is she goes, like, your name has been all over my friend's life. And so now I'm going to put her name all over you. And so where before all of her sort of efforts to place revenge on people have been not good things, like very crazy things, but at least relatively harmless. But at this end, she like comes at him with a scalpel and she's going to like carve her friend's name into this guy's body. And he breaks one hand free and gets gains power over her and asphyxiates her with a pillow, smothers her with a pillow and she dies. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the main Climax. Well, she dies, and then then the friend. Well, there's a whole like yeah, ten minutes afterwards. That's true. She yeah, dies. it's not that's the end, the... but that's kind of like the rough overview of the story. Which, yeah. and I'm sure we'll dive into more pieces of it yeah. as okay. we as we go. So that's the story. It's really incredible. And my question for you, Emma and Kelly, mm-hmm. is just first of all, what were your initial reactions to the film? What did you love, and what did you not love? Mm. I am a huge horror movie fan. I love horror movies. Um, Not as much like gory, like Saw, not my thing. But, um, you know, this idea of like, it was kind of promoted as like a female serial killer in the trailer that kind of is the assumptions you make. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very excited going into it. Like, finally, a movie about a female serial killer. Um, It is not that. She's playing mind games the whole time. So I found myself halfway through a little disappointed. (laughs) But then I kind of rallied at the end. um, And there were really good conversations had based on the message between me and my husband about it. I really liked a lot of it. I liked a lot of the technicality of the film, the technicality of the writing. I thought it was very masterfully done. I like that she is a very, I mean, we kind of talked about it the other day, but she's like a very flawed character. Um, She's not the well put together woman we're used to seeing. And I really appreciated that. Um... Some of the scenes felt a little disjointed. Like, there wasn't a clear vibe, if you will, throughout, like, that was consistent throughout the film. But there was lots I really liked about it. And overall, I think it was a really, really good movie with a really good message, especially about how, um, as society, for some reason, we try to protect men. And we um, think men, like didn't have another option or it wasn't their fault which we see a lot at the end the way um his i forget his name the guy that kills cassie al 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 yeah and then um his friend is coming to comfort him joe played by max greenfield aka schmidt from new girl it was really he was funny (laughs) um but like seeing their dialogue and how they comforted and consoled in each other was like Oh, interesting. That was that was very intriguing to me. So yeah, so pretty much what like. happens is that this um, this Al he kills Cassie and then is just stuck with her in bed all night, like Cause terrified because he's still friends, handcuffed yeah. with one hand yeah. to the bed. And um, his friends are drugged, and his friends are drugged. So his friend comes out like probably late morning. He, mm-hmm. He's like, oh, it was a great night, and you know he's like 
she's dead. Like, she's so dead. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nah, you're kidding. I don't believe you. And then eventually figures out that, oh, crap, like, she is dead. And his immediate response is like, it's not your fault. You didn't do this. Yeah. And he it's has okay. no idea what happened. We're going to we're gonna figure it out. Yeah. We're going to take gonna care of You're going to be fine. This. We're going to take care You're of this. You're a good guy. Yeah. And you yeah. see this, like, band of, like, brothers yeah. kind of happen of, like, I'm going to take care of this for you. You're not going down for this. But the thing is, you never see, like, oh, what happened? Like, yeah. He, he never gives Al the chance to, like, tell his story. He just mm-hmm. immediately writes the narrative for him mm-hmm. that it wasn't his fault. Everything's going to be fine. And obviously, this crazy stripper is the reason that she's dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which was very sweet. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like, so true. Yeah. 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 I think for me, I, um, I, I went into it sort of recognizing, based off of watching the trailer, I was like, oh, this seems like she could be killing these people or she might not be. And I was very, like, I can't wait to, like figure it out you know um and so it was really interesting to me um and i was it i I would i would bill this as like a a dark comedy thriller yeah basically Mm, is is what it is and um so it's not like a full-blown horror movie or anything um at all but it's really uh a a very original take, I think, on mm-hmm. um, t- this discussion of sexual assault and violence against women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, I, I was really enthralled the whole time. There wasn't a moment where I was really bored, um, except for probably the last 10 minutes after Cassie dies. You're kind of like, okay, well, our main character is gone. <laughs> and I think that was really brave of them mm-hmm. um, as, like, I think that's brave of... Um, Emerald Fennel to like choose to get rid of the person who's been driving this plot the entire time mm-hmm. and to have like a full 10 minutes of the movie just be without her. Uh, I think that was really uh, an interesting choice of hers and that was a brave choice. And I think that you see a big distinction in the way that uh, the sort of vibe of the movie looks. Mm-hmm. I kind of disagree with you a little bit, Kellyanne, that I felt like the vibe was vibe i hate that word what but is the, the, vibe? the continuity i felt the... like the the imagery and sort of the the color palette the the way that it was filmed was pretty consistent to me throughout and i mm. felt like it it made sense together and um i think that there were specific choices of like the way that scenes where she's interacting with these men who are predators looked versus ways that things looked when she was with ryan which was bo burnham's character and like how that was very like candy pop like love story rom com and then also the way that the film looked and those last 10 minutes after she's gone there's a lot like the color is sort of gone and there's a lot of sort of desaturated and it's it's a much different feeling uh, for that last 10 minutes of the film but uh, that was probably the least uh, like interesting part of it to me was those, that last bit but um, it was fascinating to me because uh as I was watching it, I watched it with my mom and her fiance. And we were watching it and maybe like 30 minutes into the film, my mom we took a break because my mom needed to like smoke and we like needed to go to the bathroom and stuff. And uh my mom's fiance is like freaking out watching this movie. Mm-hmm. He is feeling so like um on edge. Uh, and I feel like the like thriller aspect of it is affecting him way more than it was affecting me. And my mom were like, "LOL, why are you laughing? Like this is great." <laughs> and, um, or why not? Why are you laughing? Why are you freaking out? And we're laughing at him. And I feel like this is something that might feel more sort of like a nerve wracking film to a man mm-hmm. uh, because it is something that. Uh, is sort of like a man's biggest fear. I think they actually say that in the movie, that this is a man's worst fear. And then Mm -hmm. I think uh, Cassie, uh, Carrie... Mulligan. Mulligan. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I couldn't think of her last name. Carrie Mulligan's character, uh, she says, well, what do you think a woman's worst fear is? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's heavily implied. Obviously, she's referencing to sexual assault and rape and being violated in that way by a man. Um, And so that was really interesting to me, too, to be watching it with a man and see his reaction versus myself and my mother's reactions Mm -hmm. um, as this is something that women have talked about so much, I feel like, for centuries. Uh, And it's something that women are so aware of, whereas men are kind of able to sort of shove it to the back of their minds and not really think about it and Mm -hmm. um, kind of just 
carry on Mm because they don't have to live with a constant threat. Mm -hmm. And this film sort of shows men under threat. Well, Mm -hmm. and it's very illuminating to the perception that women have towards like sexual assault and how men or a lot of women Mm -hmm. and I think most men the average dude is not necessarily aware of that perception and it's a scary perception that someone could see you as like threatening Mm -hmm. and yeah so a monster really yeah really yeah and I'm sure a lot of men have will have issues with watching it um but with an open mind It's interesting, though, because I don't think that it was a a man-hater film. No. No, It did not not. feel like uh, Emerald Fennel was trying to be like, well, all men just suck, and they're the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that every single character is flawed in the movie. Yes. Men and women, except maybe, like, Laverne Cox, (laughs) (laughs) um, which is uh, Cassie's boss in the film. Uh, And friend. Yes, and friend. But mo- pretty much every character you see, her old friend Madison is truly very flawed. Cassie is very flawed. Ryan is flawed. Al Monroe is flawed. Joe, everybody. And um, th- I think that it was more looking at the the gray of it, of, okay, like, the these people are, like, nice guys, quote unquote. They're quote-unquote good people i don't think they really show a man who's like truly like evil Malicious, through and through yeah. um i think that it's looking at the tension of like how insidious this mindset of uh sexual assault being okay mm-hmm. is and then also how uh normalized it's become and i think that over the past you know, five to ten years, our society's been trying to break that down, um, but it's still, it's still an issue. Totally, yeah. I definitely felt like the film was a big like f you to the male gaze. Mm-hmm. Um, in a lot of ways, it had a lot of nods to things that it was, uh, it was making fun of. Mm-hmm. Um, if you guys have seen our episode on feminist film theory. Great. If you haven't, give it a watch because that will illuminate some of these things that I'm talking about. Or listen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, My favorite thing about the film and the thing that hooked me at the very beginning was this, like, opening scene where it just has this, like, roaming camera close, like, close up on men's crotches. As they're dancing in a club. like In khakis. Yeah, in khakis. Like, they're just regular old, like, 30 to 40-year-old men, like, dad bod type of situation. And um, uh, it just, like, this camera is just, like, in there. And if it was women, we would see it a lot differently. We'd Mm -hmm. see it as something sexy, something to be desired. But because it's men, there's sort of this, like, shock factor. And it's really funny. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's kind of like, yeah, this is what your camera does to us all the time. Yeah. yeah. Which I just found, like, really funny. Because um, it was kind of like, oh, this is what this is about. Like, there's no secrets here. Like, we're we're going against the patriarchy. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I thought it was really brilliant. There's tons of, like, great little twists where you think something's going to go one way and it goes yeah. another. Where you think someone's going to be seriously harmed and then they're not. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's believable, too, because... Cassie, Carrie Mulligan's character, is so, like, off her rocker or so, like, unpredictable. You mm-hmm. really don't necessarily know what she's going to do mm-hmm. and um, or what's going to happen to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, like, for example, the first morning after she takes a guy home or a guy takes her home, I should say, um, she, he's kind of like laying on top of her in his bedroom and she's like what are you doing she's acting drunk he's like oh don't worry about it don't worry about it and he's like starting to go down on her and like take off her clothes and she's like what are you doing and then she sort of like opens her eyes and looks up at the camera and she says his name I forget what it is and she's like sober suddenly yeah and she goes what are you doing and then he like freaks out suddenly Mm -hmm. because she's sober and so we don't necessarily know what happens she kind of says something menacing, and mm-hmm. then it cuts to her the next morning doing the quote-unquote walk of shame, and she's got, like, what looks like blood running down her leg, and then the camera slowly pans up, and there's, like, we realize it's 
ketchup mm-hmm. from a hot dog. From a hot dog. <laughs> I've actually heard some people think it's a hamburger, and I've heard some people think it's a jelly donut. So it's some sort of... I thought it was too, but in interviews, they said it was a hot dog. Okay. okay. <laughs> it is confirmed hot dog. Confirmed hot dog. So she's eating <laughs> a hot dog. Which is also like a really funny thing because it's a very phallic thing that she's right. eating yes, as well. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So she's like, you think like, oh, she just she just killed him, but then it pans up and she's eating a hot dog. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Walking on. But you're still like... She still might have killed him. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's you still know. possible. You don't yeah. know. And so things like that were very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and then t- toward, like, throughout the film, you you discover, like, oh, she's not actually murdering people. She's, like, teaching them a little lesson and yeah. leaving. Yeah. Um, what but, I like about that scene, too, yeah. is, like, she gets catcalled <gasps> from across the street. And she stops. And she just stares at this these three construction workers that are, like, catcalling her. And she just, like, stares at them. Yeah. And then it makes them uncomfortable. They get scared. And yeah. then they're like, fuck you. Yeah. Like, they, it switches so quick. And then she just, like, walks off and keeps <laughs> eating her hot dog. And yeah. it's like, that's kind of the echo of the film. Mm-hmm. Like, guys are like, oh, you're desirable. And as soon as you, like, give them the, the attention or, like show any resolve or power then they're like nope not into that yeah Yeah. it's interesting like going from for example blackout drunk to sober and being like what are you doing men are like freaked out yeah like oh you're afraid of you're more afraid of a sober woman than a drunk woman Mm -hmm. yeah and it's like okay so why does that scare you you know Mm -hmm. like what why does me being sober all of a sudden scare you if if you're doing Mm -hmm. nothing wrong Mm -hmm. right then it shouldn't yeah. matter, yeah. right? And most of these men are not willing to admit that they did do anything wrong. Like right. they're yeah. like, oh, you, I just give me your right. I'm a nice yeah. guy. Yeah. I'm a good guy. Well, I thought we had a connection. I was connection. worried about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that oh. one guy. Ugh. And I'm like, no, you tried to get her to do cocaine and then have sex with you. He literally forced cocaine yeah, into, into her, her mouth. mouth. Yeah. Oh, going back to the food, though, one thing I noticed about her is that she's constantly eating throughout the film. Like, she's got, like, a tw- Twizzler in her mouth. She's eating candy. She's eat- She's always eating. Has a sucker. Yeah. Something. And I don't know what that means necessarily, but how I interpreted it was, like, hey, yeah, she's a woman and she eats. <laughs> I way, also like, really like that they're... They, they're kind of more sexy foods, yeah. if you will, like the hot dog, the sucker, the Twizzler. She's playing with it in her mouth. And it's kind of like... Drawing it's you also, her mouth. Yeah. It's kind of like sensual, but also like I'm a human. Yeah. And I like that it's kind of both. Yeah. Because she's also like, I'm not interested in giving yeah. you what you want. Well, I just don't know if I see women eating very often in film. Yeah. And I think, like, part of it is just, like, hey. Unless it's, like, a salad. Yeah. Hey, people, women eat. (laughs) They have to eat to, like, feed their bodies. And this is, I don't know. That's how I took that. But I thought that was interesting. Like, Mm -hmm. an interesting little thing that they inserted there. Yeah. But, yeah, anyways, loved a lot of things about it. Uh, Things I didn't like. um, It felt like from a director's standpoint, she occasionally switched from, like, one format to, like, a Wes Anderson-style shooting. Um, Which I'm curious. I need to research this more because maybe there's, like, intention behind that. Maybe not. But it felt more like, oh, this looks cool. Let's just do this. As opposed to, like, feeling like it had, like, a purpose. And so I found that a little jarring as I was watching through. It felt like, okay, is this a Wes Anderson film or not? Like, I agree. <laughs> there's sort of a mixture of like cinematography styles that, and like framing decisions that I wasn't like clear on. The protagonist, Cassandra, aka Cassie, aka Carrie Mulligan, we're going to say Carrie Mulligan so many times that you're going to know, is a deeply flawed human, yet some somehow we find ourselves rooting for her in a way. Mm-hmm. She's the main character. Um, did you guys have a hard time reconciling that? Did you enjoy the anti-hero story? Like, what were your thoughts there? For me, personally, as, like, a film consumer, I'm a big fan of, like, the anti-hero. And I really like having someone who's so sort of complex and um, who is flawed. And so, for me, I didn't really have a hard time. I didn't feel, like, conflicted about liking her, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I I liked her, and I think there were some times where I was like, I just wish that you would, like... I want good for you, you know? Like, like I I want 
this to be your relationship with Ryan to be good and like I want you guys to fall in love and live happily ever after and like I want uh you to feel like you're like you know living your life to the fullest and to be able to get that like mental help health health help that you need uh and so I I think I was I was rooting for her and but at the same time I I think I was also like empathizing with her a lot and feeling like like yes like this is not maybe the way that I would have handled this or like it's hard for me to even say that because I have not been in the situation she's in but like I um I don't really like fault her that much if that makes sense I think that uh I think that we see like revenge stories where men like run around and like kill a million people and like whatever and just like it's fine and so in this this more of a psychological revenge that she's taking on and almost a more realistic revenge uh i was more willing to like accept that if that Mm -hmm. makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah Mm. yeah i did not have any problem whatsoever rooting for her actually i mean i was ready to root. well you wanted her to kill them i wanted her to kill him um (laughs) But I actually appreciated that that ended, even though at first I was a little disappointed. Um, I actually ended up appreciating that because that feels like if she was killing them, that would feel like a male story just played by a female character versus like a female story being played by a female character. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's smarter because nothing can be traced to her. Like, like everyone is psychologically affected by encounters with her but like she is in the clear yeah. like when mm-hmm. it comes down it's not to like the something law. you can prosecute or well, something well and also yeah. like exactly she is not then i i feel like she tries to never really like stoop as low as as the her catalyst which was al monroe raping her friend Nina, like, she tries to never stoop quite as low as they do. Mm -hmm. She does some really low things. Until the end. She does really low things, like, making Madison think that she was raped. And that part, I was really, like... And not, like, like, calling her back. Yeah, yeah, that part, I was very... That was one moment where I was kind of, like, disappointed in Cassie. When we didn't know for sure if she was raped or not, I was like, if she just had someone rape Madison, that is... Mm -hmm just like a whole new level of low Mm -hmm. well and to illuminate that scene too as she's getting day drunk and more and more day drunk she starts asking her about the situation and like what she thought about it and this is where madison starts going oh well so long ago i mean you know you can't blame them for things that happened in you know school and like she was you know had a reputation for getting drunk and things like that and so Madison refuses to, like, acknowledge that what happened to Nina was wrong um, or undeserved, Mm. you could say. And she's sitting here, like, getting herself drunk (laughs) in the middle of a restaurant. And um, Cassie has, like, someone just take her up to a room and, like, put her to bed. Yeah. I mean, and the whole whole point of why I even bring it up is just that that was a moment where I felt disappointed in her because I thought if she did get this totally have this woman be raped then Mm -hmm. that's just like a whole other level of low but you see that she um doesn't ever stoop to their level um even in what she wants to do to al monroe like she she wants to harm him physically but not uh i wouldn't say to the extent of the trauma that nina Mm -hmm. would have received by being I don't, I don't know. know about that. I feel like mutilating someone is like very on a very fine line with raping someone. It's very similar. Yeah. You're violating their person. Yeah, but it's I don't know. I guess to me, like the the sexual aspect gives it a different dimension. Um, but it's definitely like the lowest thing that it's she not cool. she tries yeah, to do. It's not. Um, but yeah, I can't say that I found myself disappointed in her, actually. Um, well, I wasn't, once I, we knew that it wasn't a rape, I was, totally. I was like, I would have been totally. if she had Yeah, had it's still really rape. messed up, though. But it yeah. is I twisted. mean, yeah, it's yeah. messed up, but I'm yeah. like, that's kind of the name of this game a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, totally. oh, you're messing with the people that didn't come to your friend's defense or um, were perpetrators. And so, I don't know, I kind of liked it. A little bit. Yeah. A lot of it. I think 
part of me was kind of like, uh, when she got a boyfriend, actually, mm-hmm. because I was like, oh, this is what's going to quote unquote make her better and heal her. But it and doesn't. I'm like, it doesn't, but like that, how we started moving that direction, how she started moving to be more, a more well, like, I don't know, like healthy person, if you will. How dare she? <laughs> because because a man came into her life. Mm. And I was mm. like, no, you should get healthy on your own for you, mm. not because you now have a partner. Right. And so I found myself frustrated with that. And I mean, that came full circle. But I was just like, part of me was just like, Bleh. Yeah. Um. So, but overall, I wasn't disappointed actually yeah. once until she threatened Al with a knife. And I'm like, yeah, and part of me is like, no, he shouldn't have killed her. But I'm also like, she threatened him, like, with a knife. And that, at some level, he did need to defend himself. Yeah. Should she have been killed? No. But should she have brought a knife to threaten him with? Also no. Yeah, totally. But it's like, does that justify murder? And I think, like, totally. what it points out, especially the murder scene is interesting because they filmed it in the length of time it actually takes to smother someone. Yeah. Yeah, two minutes, 30 seconds. And it's long. It and is And you're very sitting long. there and you're like, when is this going to end? And throughout that, you see, first of all, that this man has taken power over this woman and he had many chances to mm-hmm. make a different choice throughout mm-hmm. that process before she was actually dead. Mm-hmm. And he didn't make that choice. Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because uh, this was filmed... Uh, I think early 2020 or late 2019. Uh, so it was before the incident with George Floyd happened, mm-hmm. but it's it's very similar mm-hmm. in somebody intentionally choosing for an extended period of time to deprive another human of oxygen. And that I think is something that a lot of people have resonated with in the film in it being very timely, both with talking about sexual assault and uh, just like the issues of of women receiving respect, but then also the intentionality that that took to choose to smother somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that was very, that was like a very visceral moment for me and I'm sure for many people watching it in in light of everything that happened in 2020 and like on top of that the fact that like they chose to not have her killed with like a gun or in some sort of gory way or in something that would be more uh quick or instant mm-hmm. or whatever they, like a, there was no real fight right. there was no action and it's not like it was a snap decision you know no. like it was a Ian. constant intentional yes, decision exactly mm-hmm. yeah i found myself in that scene very fascinated with watching al mm-hmm. because at first you see him like he is being threatened with a knife he is fearing for his life clearly mm-hmm. he snaps and you see this like animalistic almost fight to live but then as that that scene slowly goes on you see that fade away and it turns almost into like annoyance Like, he is, like, inconvenienced. And, like, it's, like, a job that he's, like, that he feels like he has to finish for some reason. And that's what was very intriguing for me as well, to watch his experience because, and, like, how he chose to act that out. Mm -hmm. And that was also very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you even see, like, as Cassie's body becomes less and less uh well she she loses energy Mm -hmm. as she's being deprived of oxygen as she's struggled uh as she's struggled for so long and she starts instead of thrashing she she just sort of starts to just like move her hands and slowly move her legs and you see al just sort of swat her away Mm -hmm. and he's just like stop moving stop you just just stop moving Mm-hmm. And it's almost like this, um, this like mantra that he starts to take on of like stop, just stop moving, just stop moving, and he just mm-hmm. wants her to stop moving. Mm-hmm. And but that her stopping moving, I feel like that's almost him detaching himself from this thought that he's killing somebody. He's like, I just want her to stop moving. Yeah, and that's what he's telling himself over and over again. But yeah. he's he's killing her, yeah. and that's what her stopping move like. That's how she's going to stop. Ooh, mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah. I definitely think, like, 
if anyone loves like a Joker film or, you know, things like that, like it's not hard to watch a movie like this and like understand and empathize with the main character, but mm-hmm. also like understand that they are in need of a lot of help and that mm-hmm. they're a danger potentially to society. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of things that Carrie does or Cassie does are like overall harmless, but like a lot of twisted stuff. Like mm-hmm. you wouldn't like yeah. look at someone like that and be like, they have a bright future, you know, like you'd be yeah. like, mm, this probably seems like it's going to eventually escalate to something worse. Yeah. But then like it culminates in this man who appears to have grown up. He doesn't want to participate in the crazy bachelorette stuff. He really ca- seems to care about his fiance. He's turned into a good guy. Yeah. And or it seemingly. And then. It's almost like that capacity that he had to overpower someone in rape is not gone. And Mm -hmm. it comes out when he feels like his future is threatened. Yeah. Well, and that's actually something. Okay. Two things in there. (laughs) One thing is that I think that the only realistic conclusion here uh, was for Cassie to die to me. Because... She's literally putting herself in harm's way constantly. She is putting herself in situations where uh, every weekend she is going out, pretending she's drunk, going home with random strangers Mm -hmm. who are drunk, who are literally drunk. And she may be sober, but that still doesn't negate the fact that she's with men who are stronger than her. She's with men who could get angry and violent. They may have weapons in their home. She is putting herself in a very dangerous situation every single week, Mm -hmm. multiple times a week, it seems. And so, like, the fact that she has gone as far as she has is almost kind of miraculous Mm -hmm. in a way because these men could choose to rape her anyways. They could choose to kill her, to harm her. Like, there's... There's so much that could go wrong, and it seems like she's sort of come out of it relatively unscathed. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was actually, I heard, um, a scene that they deleted uh, where it shows her having a bruise on her wrist after one of those nights and sort of showed a little bit of that um, risk that she's taking, that that she she could be getting hurt. Um, And just having a bruise on her wrist really isn't too much to walk away with, but it's still... um, kind of amazing that she doesn't and she's not like a she's not like a martial artist or a spy Mm. or some sort of trained person in 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 self-defense or anything like that uh she is literally just a girl Mm -hmm. who has chosen to do these things who's having somewhat of of a mental break and uh it i think that her dying in the end at the hands of al monroe uh is kind of the only way it could have gone uh, outside of if she had some, unless she had chosen to get help, basically. Mm. Um, Because even though she was with Ryan and they were having this like rom-com moment and they were in love and all these things, it still didn't really change the actual like mental health things that she had going on. Mm -hmm. Because the second that things were brought back up, um, which Madison uh, brought up later on when she gave Cassie um, a video of the incident where Nina was raped mm-hmm. and she saw that Ryan was a bystander in that, it, instantly her relationship with him is broken and instantly she is back at uh, the this revenge plot that she's been going towards the entire movie. Mm-hmm. And so it it's really the only way that she could have gone outside of getting actual help because the Ryan relationship was really more of a Band-Aid than an actual uh, healing or an actual, um, you know, like, solution for her. Mm. Uh, But one other thing that uh, this makes me think about uh, is you saying that Al Monroe had uh, been reformed, you know? Like, he is like a good guy now, you know, he's seemingly, yeah, seemingly a good guy. He's going to get married to this beautiful swimsuit model, which seems like a little bit creepy to me when they talk about her being like a swimsuit model. And I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, very shallow, <laughs> like, but okay. you know, whatever she wants to do to make the bread. Um, and then, uh, 
he uh, doesn't want to have a stripper at his bachelor party and then he doesn't want to have sex with her when she takes him upstairs and things like that. It's like, oh, he's like kind of a good guy. And then um, one interaction that we haven't talked about yet is her going to uh, Dean Walker, who's the dean of the medical school that they went to. Mm-hmm. And Dean Walker talks as well about how um, Al was such a great guy and how Al spoke at their school recently and how when Cassie starts to bring up the incident with Nina that Nina had reported to Dean Walker, Dean Walker says, well, we wouldn't want to ruin this boy's future over this. Yeah. And she didn't. Mm-hmm. Well, His future is bright. And that's the th- interesting thing about this film is that it sort of explores this theme of the nice guy, mm-hmm. um, which we hear... Uh, for anyone that's not familiar, the nice guy is, you know, the the guy that gets broken up with or gets friend zoned, and it's always the nice guy who bad mm-hmm. things happen to, right? So it's kind of like a self pitying form of mind, and um, you sort of see this theme throughout the movie of these guys who have the appearance like they're not necessarily like douchebags. On the onset, they're kind mm-hmm. of nerds. Some of them are sort of like, you know, they're not like the most handsome or like yeah. powerful men in society. You know, they're just mm-hmm. like nice guys who are like, ooh, this girl seems like she needs a ride home. Mm-hmm. And if something happens or blossoms from that, like, then great. Mm-hmm. Um, and their inability, it seems, to reconcile with their problems when she confronts them is always sort of like no 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 I'm a nice guy. So did you guys feel like these descriptions depictions were accurate, messagey? Did you enjoy that kind of dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think there were aspects of that that I enjoyed, especially like, oh, I'm just going to help her. I'm going to like get her a ride home, but then you don't take her home. You take her to her your apartment, um, which is not a place that she asked to go. Um, but also, part of me is like, oh, man, there are actual, like, good guys out there. So I don't want that to be the only message. But, I mean, they're, like, this is a narrative that I feel like happens time and time again. And I'm like, man, I feel like that needs to be more of a conversation. Like, how many nice guys actually aren't that nice? And um, it's very quick to trust someone that is a nice guy, quote unquote. And it's like, oh, maybe like that nice guy doesn't deserve your trust yet. Mm -hmm. You know, that that kind of narrative is is interesting overall. And especially like this concept of, you know, you might be like a nice guy look like on the outside. But what do you do when no one's watching? Totally. And it's not like in reference to upstanding men you know right. it's in reference to the nice guy in quotations like, like yeah. the guy who always has a justification for his actions and it was never you know intentional and he's not responsible for anything and yeah like he's just a poor guy who's just really nice and yeah it's so hard for him just like a poor nice guy it's hard to be a really nice white white nice guy from a rich family that's been to med school, makes lots of money, and is going to marry a supermodel. It's so hard, especially it's when... It's really hard. Especially when you rape someone, and that could potentially ruin, ruin your whole future. everything. That's so hard. I was drunk. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, that's the thing is, um, <laughs> these are arguments that are legitimately used Definitely. in mm-hmm. cases... Of rape, a hundred percent, and of sexual in assault in favor of the man, and yeah. then those same arguments then are the used to vilify the woman. The woman. Yes. yes, and she it's... was drunk. She put herself in that situation. Yes. So, I mean, you hear the second guy that Cassie goes home with in the movie uh, when she reveals that she's sober. He says. Um, as an excuse, he's like, "Oh well, I'm just like really high right now because he's the one that's yeah. doing cocaine." And it's like, "Oh, but you thought that I was really drunk." And you were getting me high, so, like, you're not culpable for that, but I'm Mm -hmm. somehow was able to consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you see her literally, it's it's comedic to watch, her literally not reciprocate 
anything to these men. Mm -hmm. She's sitting in the car with the first guy who she goes home with at the beginning of the movie. And it's actually interesting because he's standing in the bar with two of his friends. And those friends are both, like, checking her out and making comments about her. And he's kind of, like... Seems uninterested. Oh, no, 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 just let her be. Yeah, he seems sort of like uninterested in her. And then he's like, okay, guys, like, I'm just going to go make sure she's okay. And then he winds up being the one that tries to take her home and, and rape her. And uh, when they're in the car on the way, he says, oh, well, my apartment's like really close. Do you want to just like have a nightcap? And it's like, Tell me in what world you think that a girl who was so drunk she couldn't find her cell phone, so drunk she couldn't figure out a way to get home, wants another drink with you in your apartment. She's and also about to throw up yes, out yeah. the side of your she vehicle. She literally like, is like totally unresponsive to this. She's, I'm pretty sure she says she doesn't want to go to his apartment. He's pretty much insistent. Mm-hmm. And then she's just kind of like, oh. She's because like, she's because home. she's quote unquote drunk. Yeah. And then when they get into his apartment, he starts kissing her and she is she's not absolutely not reciprocating in any way. She it's is so t- awkward. It's, it's so, so funny. funny. Oh. Yes. And she is just like mouth closed, just like mm, straight faced. And he is just like macking on her. Like, and into it. Uh, yeah. And it's just like, and it's very similar with the other guy who was doing the cocaine and. Um, I think that it's sort of, it, it's showing the way that these men are viewing women mm-hmm. as uh, a means to an end. He doesn't care if she reciprocates. He doesn't care if she's into it. He doesn't care if she genuinely consents. Yeah. Because he's like an all-around good guy. And he he's just, you know, trying to, you know, fulfill his need as a man. Yeah, he's just, and, you know, they have a connection and he's hoping to get lucky. That's all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's very interesting. And I think that, like I mentioned before, that this movie is really good at showing sort of how insidious the th- this whole idea of, of, consent and um, rape culture has been in our society and how uh, these men are able to just reason things away and how they're also able to uh, think of themselves as nice guys uh, because they aren't maybe as bad as something else that they've Mm -hmm. seen or Mm -hmm. because they, uh, you know, you know, they, they kept her from somebody who would have, you know, really done something bad yeah, to her. Yeah, been really mean. Mm-hmm. And I think that part of why these guys are so, like, why they choose to use this, like, nice guy trope is because um, it's showing that this is not just something that, like, these evil people are doing. Mm-hmm. And, like, these guys are are your like quote unquote average joes and they're normal mm. and because of that it's 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 revealing to us as an audience that this is not something that just happens with like you know cr- quote unquote crazy people like this is a a day to day this is an average you know yeah. yeah i think it also speaks to a little bit of like the helpless damsel that mm-hmm. needs rescuing um, as well as, like, the knight in shining armor. It's like, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to rescue you. Um, and, and get my reward. And get my reward. Yeah. And men, yeah. um, I feel like men in general really fall for that. Like, they're like, I need to feel important. So I'm going to do something nice for this woman. Um, and it's like, man, we've really told, we've really told men that women can be a prize to be one Mm -hmm. and that they need rescuing and so it's easy for her to entrap men in a way um not that she's like hmm i don't know if that word's accurate but to describe what happened but in a way they kind of are just like suckers for this this trick that Mm -hmm. she pulls on them because they're like oh well i'm gonna rescue her and she's like gotcha Like, she doesn't need rescuing. Well, and this is a little bit reading between the lines, too, but it's based a little bit on my own personal experience as well, is that the men who take her home are not men who are wildly successful and attractive and able to get any woman they want, right? These are men who, like, haven't been laid in a while. They're not necessarily the most handsome, 
you know, guy. They probably find women that are as attractive as Cassie's character intimidating and someone mm-hmm. and someone way out of their league. And so it's almost like they see someone vulnerable and they like go for it because mm-hmm. they're like, this might be my chance to get this like beautiful, you woman. know, perfect ten or whatever. But in a sense, she's preying on their vulnerabilities and insecurities and thinking that they can't do better than that Mm -hmm. in a way. And so, like, their weakness is, like, very clear. And again, that's reading between the lines. But in a lot of ways, like, these nice guys are are guys who, you know, they're not the homecoming kings of the world. But because they, you know, aren't bullies, Mm -hmm. they think that they're... They've fallen into this category of like a good person, yeah. But they are blind to their own decision making. Yeah, um, yeah. They're somehow exempt from the not okayness of their actions. Yeah, and I think unfortunately Ryan's character really like seals the deal on the nice guy trope. Oh yeah. Where throughout the whole film he's so respectful and kind and unassuming and like. Um, not overpowering in any way. He's, like, very gentle. And when she reveals to him that she has this video, and she's obviously very upset, may not have been as upset with him if it hadn't been something so personal to her. To her. But because this has, like, been her life's work, essentially getting back at people who are culpable yeah. in this situation, like, she does not have the capacity to be with him anymore, mm-hmm. honestly. I don't think that they had a chance after that happened. Um, whether or not they should have, I don't know. Morality is not black and white. But um, his response is is the part that I think makes him a villain, not necessarily the fact that he was at a party in his college years. Like, it's his denial and trying to, like, sort of make it work. And then, like, he sort of lashes out at her at the end. Mm-hmm. And um, when she, and she like says either you give me the address to Al's bachelor party or I'm gonna like release this video. And so he gives her the um, he gives her the address and then when the police come to his office several mm-hmm. days later and this guy's a pediatrician right so like pediatric surgeon oh mm-hmm. yeah pediatric like he's an angel mm-hmm. as far as society is concerned and this officer sort of softball asks him some questions. And Ryan, knowing that someone he loved, had just recently said he loved, um, is missing, he denies any, like, knowledge of where she might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And out of his own self-preservation, says that he thinks she would probably self-harm. And so he assists in a possible suicide narrative that he doesn't actually have evidence for and i think that i mean she is obviously mentally unstable sure so i don't think that the idea that she could have self-harmed is totally out of the picture but especially from ryan's perspective but it's not true to but he does have the information yeah Mm -hmm. of knowing where she was going that weekend and so that is it's wrong but i do see how ryan was able to somewhat justify that in knowing like well like she was kind of you know I didn't really know because if you think from Ryan's perspective uh during the beginning of their relationship he catches her while she's out Mm -hmm. and she's hanging all over this other man and he's like what the heck you won't even kiss me and yet here you are like appearing to be blasted drunk hanging on some random guy after we've been like going on dates and it's like obviously you're not I don't know what's going on with you and then like once he takes her back after that instance like he it it seems like everything is like roses and sunshine and daisies but then she he sees her sort of like another side of her again when she confronts him about the video and so I could see how Ryan especially from the fact that he is um afraid of his reputation Mm -hmm. being tarnished how he would be able to self-reason well she was just kind of she was just crazy Mm. yeah and that may be the case i didn't when i watched his performance i took it as a lie well i think it was both i I mean maybe but like the thing is if you really cared about someone and you heard that they're missing and you know where they went and you know that these are aggressive potentially harming men like 
wouldn't, despite your, your anger, like, wouldn't your response be to like, oh, no, I got to go find her, you know? Mm. She's, she really lost it this time or whatever. But instead, he chooses his own reputation over her, which I'm not saying, again, morality is very gray, but he he justifies to himself that he's the nice guy and she's crazy and mm-hmm. she is crazy. But um, that to me was just like a knife to the heart mm. and like this idea that you could trust someone and build up all this relationship with someone and they could seem to deny your expectations of, you know, toxic masculinity, et cetera, and then turn around and be like that. Mm. Yeah. And I think that one thing that is interesting when Cassie does confront Ryan uh, is that, this is, I think we see that Cassie is not totally unreasonable um, because as she sort of goes through her like revenge plot, hitting all these different people with Dean Walker, um, with Madison. the lawyer, with Madison, um, you see she only uh, like lashes out at these people when they refuse to actually acknowledge and like show remorse Mm -hmm. for the situation and the only person who does is the lawyer who we haven't even really talked about but he's a pretty small character but he is the lawyer that um convinced her friend nina to drop her case of sexual assault against al monroe and he did that that was basically his career as a lawyer was to do that for for young men who had been accused of sexual assault and he felt tons of remorse about this and she chooses to not do anything to him Mm -hmm. Um, but every other person including ryan you see go into denial go into victim blaming go into Mm self-preservation um and that i think was where you sort of reveal like okay cassie like has a lot of mental things going on but she she does have a standard yeah well and it's not even that she doesn't do anything to him she forgives him Mm -hmm. yeah so she's capable of forgiveness of forgiveness and i i mean perhaps if it had gone differently maybe bo burnham's character could have talked to her and they you know would have found a way to at least be friends or you know to like i don't know if they could have ever been in a relationship i doubt it but i'm not saying it couldn't happen but yeah like she she's not like oh, you apologized, I'm going to now still hurt you. Like, Mm. she's very much, like, looking for that remorse, looking for people who, like, will repent, I guess. Yeah. Which, again, she's not God, so that's not, like, fair either way, but, you know. But I think you also see her intelligence in that because she's constantly has plans and counter plans, and I think she knew... Me and James had a very long conversation about this, but I think walking into that bachelor party, she knew that she may or may not come out alive. Totally. I think she had plans ahead of time. I mean, we see that at the very end. But James actually was frustrated because he was like, I felt like she died by suicide. Like she walked in knowing she was going to die. And she did it anyways. And he found himself very frustrated with her at that. And he was like, she put herself in so much danger. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, I guess I see that perspective as well. But you also hear this insinuation that this is a underground movement of women. When when, uh, Bo Burnham's character finds her walking out of a club with a man and she, they get into this verbal thing and she tells this man, oh, I didn't get you, but there are other women doing this, and if I didn't get you, one of them will. Oh, I took that to be, like, a lie. I took it to be an empty threat. I think she was trying to, like, scare him from ever doing it I took her 100% seriously. Mm, That's interesting. I mean, she could have been. That's very Um, possible, yeah. Yeah, I I think I took it as a lie because we don't ever see her really interact with, like, other women Mm. who are doing the same thing as her, or, like, hinting at some sort of... I don't know, underground network of women who are just, like, mm. scaring the bejesus <laughs> out, of, yeah. out yeah. of these men. But, I mean, it's possible for sure. Yeah. And I think I think I, I thought about that same sort of idea that, that James had of her um, sort of knowing that yeah. she's going to die that night. And obviously she has the counter plans and um, the way that she winds up setting up Al Monroe to be arrested uh, at his wedding at the Automated end of the movie. And things, yeah, yeah, she has all these plans where she mails evidence to the lawyer and evidence to um, Laverne Cox's character and her boss. And uh, so she obviously has the plans, but I think I wouldn't call it suicide. I think I would just 
I would call it willful self endangerment. You mm-hmm. know, like she is knowing full and well that this is an option and an outcome. And I think to an extent, she saw it as the only way to actually get what she wanted mm-hmm. was for her to be willing to sacrifice her own life, to say, I'm willing to die for the sake of my friend being brought to justice. That mm-hmm. is how far I'm willing to go because nobody else seems mm-hmm. to care. Mm-hmm. Nobody gives a crap about Nina. And so I have to give everything, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. And there is actually a point in the film where she visits Nina's mom, who's played by Molly Shannon. And Nina's mom is like, what are you doing here? You have to let this go. Move on with your, her- your life. Mm-hmm. And she sort of like deletes her Facebook account so that she's not preying on this owl guy anymore. And she and Bo Burnham like start developing their romance. And actually there's a moment in the film where I'm like, like, is the director going to let her win? You know, is he going to let her, or she going to let Cassie's character move on with her life? And like, that's kind of the sweet justice of it. Mm -hmm. Although with this looming bachelor party, you know, like there's no way that she's, that's but it's an Oscar film, so like people make twists like that sometimes. So part of me was like, ooh, like what if she truly did like let herself go and be free? Mm-hmm. But then Bo Burnham turns out to be a dick, and that doesn't work out. So that's kind of a bummer. But all of this like kind of centers around these themes of like the nice guy and sexual assault and victim blaming. What would you guys argue the film's primary thesis is? And why? The primary thesis, because it has, you see all those themes you just mentioned. I think, though, for me overall, the overarching theme is men think they can get away with things. And it's not okay. And this, like, unpacking of the nice guy, of um, victim blaming, I feel like it all kind of falls under this umbrella And I feel like you see that because of how Cassie gives people the opportunity to say they were wrong. She gives people opportunities to make things right. And when they don't, she punishes them for it. And that's how I feel it all Mm. kind of sums up personally. One thing that I keep thinking about is uh, the other day, somebody said to me, the golden age of feminism is over. And... Now, there's not really that much for feminists to do because most things have been solved. What? And I was I was pretty thrown off by this comment, and I, uh, I think it's a really dangerous one. I get to an extent where it's coming from because, sure, we've made huge leaps and bounds in the feminist movement over the past hundred years, right? Women can vote. Women can get educations. Like, women have way higher levels of equality than they had before, right? Um, But I think that we see this narrative in feminism, in racism, where we say, oh, well, things are so much better now. So, you know, let's chill. And I think that uh, there that's where we get to the points where we're at now, where there's still a wage gap. There's still women being sexually assaulted, still women being treated like property, where there's still racial inequities, where Mm -hmm. there's still um, discrepancies that are deep-seated in our government, that are deep-seated in our way of life as Americans, as Westerners. I think that this film is a really just like fascinating and original way to bring this story back to the forefront and remind people that this isn't over. Um, I think that... You see, like, sure, Nina and Cassie have opportunity. They, they're they in medical school. They are, you know, doing well. They are successful women from the beginning of the film. And uh, that sort of all falls apart because of sexism, because of patriarchy, because of these um, institutions that are so deep-seated. And I think that this film is sort of that that reminder uh, mm-hmm. to me and it's that uh, reminder that that things may not look as as overtly sexist or as overtly harmful to women but they're subtle and they are prevalent mm-hmm. so to me that's sort of like the thesis of this film is 
it, we we see the the complexity of every single character is complex pretty much like every character has um, a lot of depth and a lot of um, sides to their story and uh, I think that that uh, shows the nuance um, and the the deep seated nature of of sexual assault and rape culture uh, and of so many other institutions that uh, we try to get rid of um, or try to sort of look away from and push under the rug because they're hard to look at. Uh, Just like how they choose to have the two minutes and 30 seconds of the suffocation scene at the end of the movie. Like that is a very um, intentional choice to make you look at it Mm. and not look away uh, and it's not a violent film. It's there is very little actual violence that mm-hmm. you see, and that moment is like so jarring and so visceral. I think that it's it's the, uh, the director forcing people to not be able to look away. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's great. I think um, I think for me the thesis is in the title, which. I'm going to ask you about in just a second, but in the title where it's the promising young woman. And I I believe that this title was in reference to the Brock Turner case um, where he was seen raping a woman behind a dumpster actively who was incapacitated and had witnesses pull him off of her. So this is like a cut and dry rape case. And he barely served more than three months Uh, Because the judge felt that he was a promising young man and wouldn't want to destroy his future because of one night of drinking. And I think what the film to me is saying is that like the future of men has been prioritized in like significantly prioritized over the the prospective future of women. And so this this idea of like, Cassie as the promising young woman for example is that she she is a promising young woman she's very smart she's very much like got a huge future ahead of her as a med student one of the smartest in her class Mm -hmm. and when it comes down to it her friend gets raped which is so traumatizing to her friend and her that they lose both of their futures and there, there's no concern for her future mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a sense. So I think to me what the film is saying is like, hey, women have a promising future too. And we can't like prioritize a man's future over a woman's. Like mm-hmm. rape is not something that we can tolerate anymore if we want women to have a future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that, that to me was kind of the, the end note is like women are valuable mm-hmm. too, which, you know, so revolutionary, but... We're very consumed with the idea that, you know, mm-hmm. a man could, you know, not be able to graduate med school yeah. because he raped someone. Oh, that's not fair. Yeah. You know, he well, was drunk. It's like, well, women being, her? being reprogrammed on that narrative as well. Because you see the dean, a, a woman. Yeah. Like very patriarchal values. Yeah. In that conversation. And so really like not only reprogramming society. Like you're saying, like, this can't be tolerated anymore. But even women championing women to the point that we will be each other's advocates, um, which I feel like goes beyond feminism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and to an extent, that's sort of a a self-preservation, I think, on the part of Dean Walker and on Madison's part, where they both side with the men because that's what's going to give them the most that's the most acceptable answer and response mm-hmm. according to the way society has has gone thus far and and it, it it's kind of wild to me but when uh dean walker talks about al being such a great uh guy and like he was such a great student when we learn in the film that nina was top of her class mm-hmm. and so objectively mm-hmm. nina has the most promising future of all right mm-hmm. and so why would you say, oh, we're not going to recognize your being sexually assaulted for the sake of this man's promising future when she, in fact, objectively, according to the numbers, yeah. <laughs> has the most promising future. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's good. And she has already 
had that future tarnis- tarnished just by the act of being raped. Mm-hmm. And and all she's acting asking for is for some justice. Right. But that justice will never change the yeah. fact that she was raped. Mm-hmm. Well, and in her search for justice, she gets even pummeled. She gets pummeled even more. Yeah. Essentially, of like victim blaming, being, you know, told gaslighting, being mm-hmm. told that, oh, you were drunk. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't really remember. How, how could you say that? Like, they're yeah. not only, like tarnishing like she's not only tarnished by being violated she's tarnished by lawyers like teams of rich lawyers coming after her entire person mm-hmm. yeah and like dragging and her friends and dragging mm-hmm. her and her friends through the mud yep and because she was drunk yeah and i mean and because she's a woman mm-hmm. you yeah. know yeah it wouldn't have mattered honestly i don't i think it it wouldn't even matter if she was drunk or not. She's a woman. And so, so often that means it doesn't matter if you got raped because there's an excuse. Yeah. And that sort of, you see consistently in the movie, there's always an excuse. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems like there's an expectation of like, okay, this happened to you, but it was kind of your fault. So just like get over it and move on with your life so that you can have a future and he can have a future. But it's like, no, that's not how that works. Yeah. It's like, no, no, my future will forever be affected because of the act this person, yeah, that this person chose to yeah. make. Yeah. yeah. And I was curious, did either of you have any more insights about the title Promising Young Woman to expand upon that? I think for me, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think the Promising Young Woman is both Cassie and Nina. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's also a metaphor for you know, women as a whole, just like you Mm -hmm. talked about, like, they have so much potential. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that onlookers, uh, if this were a true story, would look at this story and say, oh, that's really tragic. What a pity that they did that to themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is a perfect example of that, because she came forward to because she felt morally What's the word? Morally conflicted. Mm. Um, she felt morally conflicted about someone stepping into such a prominent position of power in our government yeah. and was like, this man has harmed me. And the narrative was, well, first of all, she got tons of media backlash for that. She, you know, her reputation was dr- drugged through the mud, like people questioning her, gaslighting, et cetera. And um, the primary message is like, well, why would she do that to herself? Mm-hmm. Like, obviously she wants attention or obviously like somehow this is like her decision to like bring harm upon herself as opposed to like trying to step forward and be honest about something that happened with a prominent lawmaker not lawmaker but um law upholder yeah yeah like that's a big deal it really is and i i think what you said was very key her name was dragged through the mud it was hers brett kavanaugh's name was Oh, he was such a good guy, and he's such a good father, and a good husband, and a good Christian. And here we go again with the good guy. Yeah, like he's a good obviously guy. Obviously, this horrible person can only be horrible for trying to, you know, tarnish his reputation. And honestly, he's 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 going to be just fine. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he made a very poor decision as a as a high schooler, teenager, whatever, and like. It's not like you can't be like, oh, that's not fair that they that came back. Like, no one gets to pick their day of reckoning. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that that's that's one of the things that's so fascinating about this film is that uh, they've chosen to show what would happen if someone chose to not move on. You know? Yeah. Like, what would happen if someone said, no, I won't let this go. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to move past this. Yeah. This is not okay. And I'm going to I'm gonna stick to that. Mm. And it's not necessarily the most mentally healthy thing to do or whatever, but I think it shows a really strong sense of loyalty from Cassie. And it shows a strong sense of right and wrong mm-hmm. from her. And I think that uh, it's, I mean, almost in some ways, like a warning to men, like, don't do this because like you never know how crazy some girl's best friend is going to be exactly <laughs> and like it's it's obviously a bit you know like we said it's like a dark comedy and yeah. it's a bit um dramatized yeah. at some points although a lot of it is feels very real yeah uh but in a way it's almost like the the theoretical of what could happen to a man maybe it'll scare some men to keep their 
penises in their pants, you know? Yeah, or, you know, like, ask a woman if she wants sex, and if she consents, then move forward. And if- But also, if a woman is, like, so, like, um, inebriated... Sure. In which case, that's there's not consent no way she either can give way. Consent. It's not consent either way. It's just not a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that's for you all to know. <laughs> Any men out there listening. Yeah. Well, and I'd be curious to see, like, hear more men's reactions to the film and, like, what some of their thoughts were. If, like, if they've seen these kinds of mindsets in their own life, if they've, if they found it hard to watch, if they found it triggering, like, really curious to know. Like, yeah, it seems like that would be hard to swallow in a lot of ways in the same way that, like, a slave movie is really hard to swallow for someone who's white. A nice, you know, the good old white person Mm -hmm. when we are very culpable in a lot of sins. So, yeah. Um, you guys, Promising Young Woman uh, has received five nominations. I just want to Amazing. rep or rep those, plug on those. Um, talk about them. Talk about um. them. We've got Best Picture, which is the most prestigious award you can win in mm-hmm. the Oscars. We've got Best Actress for Carrie Mulligan. Uh, we've got Best Director, Emerald Fennell. Best Original Screenplay from Emerald Fennell. And Best Film Editing. Wow. Um, that was Frederick Thorval. I don't know what else he does, but he's a dude. Um, and also, if any of you are interested in the Oscars or whatever, I just want to plug a couple other films. Judas and the Black Messiah is directed by Shaka King, a black man. If he won, that would be incredible. Um, Minari is a Korean film directed by Lee Isaac Chung, who is mm-hmm. a Korean director. And um, let's see. There's one more female in here. Where is she? Oh, yeah. Nomadland. I've heard this film is amazing. I have not watched it yet. Chloe Zhao is an Asian-American female. Um, Chinese-American, actually. And she directed this incredible film about transients Mm -hmm. in our society. So with Frances McDormand, who's also incredible. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of... I mean, there's also still some white males up there on the docket. But there's a lot of diverse directors coming into the Oscars this year. I'm really excited to see how it turns out. Mm Mm-hmm. With that being said, how do you guys think Promising Young Woman will fare? And if you could rate her out of 10, what would you do? Okay, I have... Rate the movie out of 10? Yes. I have not seen all the other movies. That's what makes it hard. Yeah. Yeah, so just kind of going blindly, I could... Oh, man, but I've seen the trailer for Nomadland, and that looks really good um, as well. I hope it re- it wins at least a few of what it's nominated for. Um, I mean, Carrie Mulligan killed it as actress, like as the lead. She was so, so good. And I do think it was a very good original screenplay. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as Best Picture and all the, like I said, I don't know what the other films like hold up as far as this one. But for me, in Kelly's Kelly Ann's world, I would say this is a solid, like, 9 out of 10 for me. That's good, yeah. I yeah. thought it was really good. It's a thinker. It's going to make you think. It's probably not the movie you're going to watch time and time again just for funsies, but kind of makes me think, actually, back to cuties. Like, a lot of the point is to start conversation, mm-hmm. and I think that's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will say, so of Oscar-nominated movies that I've watched thus far is Judas and the Black Messiah, Trial of the Chicago 7, Pieces of a Woman, Promising Young Woman, and... Um, uh, Marani's Black Bottom has a nomination, not for Best oh, Picture. But okay, Pieces so of I've a seen, Woman also doesn't have a nomination for Best Picture. No, so. it has a different, yeah. yeah. But um, And I'm not sure if any of them are up against Promising Young Woman on the other categories or not. I don't remember. But... Uh, yeah, of, of all of those films that I've seen that are in the Oscars this year, Promising Young Woman I enjoyed the most mm-hmm. thus far. Yeah. Um, I really, really want to watch Minari, uh, and I have heard really good things about it. And so uh, that one to me is the one that has seemed the most prevalent in my mind as as the strongest candidate for winning Best Picture, even mm-hmm. though I haven't seen it. Uh, but maybe that's just because of the people that I talk to and who I'm around who talks about it. But um, I will say that it's a movie that I actually do want to watch again. And really? like, I, yeah, I enjoyed it so much. And like, I want to uh, rewatch it. I actually thought about rewatching it before we recorded this episode and I just didn't have time. And 
yeah, I thought it was really good and really enjoyable. And while those other movies that I've seen were good, there were times where, like I said before, like this movie had me engaged like the whole time. Mm. And those other ones were really good, but not uh, as engaging as this one was. And I think that the content of this one um, was really exciting to me. One thing that I will say that I found slightly disappointing about the movie is that it's a very white movie. Um, in that it is just basically all white people the entire time. Which, I mean, it's fine, but, like, you love to see some diversity. <laughs> and, like, and, and the movie isn't about diversity, you know. But at the same time, like, I think that that could have maybe added some value to it. But um, I also think that uh, it, like you said, is very original. And mm-hmm. it's very um, sort of like exciting and like when I think about a movie like Judas and the Black Messiah which is telling a very important story and it's telling um a true story uh I think I'm starting to feel like a little bit tired of those uh even though those stories are really important I'm like okay and same with Trial of the Chicago 7 it's like okay these are great movies but like we've seen like the the biopic like a million times now and like we, I want something a little bit fresher, maybe. Mm-hmm. And so, to me, Promising a Woman felt very fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like you said, Carrie Mulligan was phenomenal in it. She she carried a lot of the movie and I think l- made room for the side characters to also really flourish in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a lot of unexpected p- actors. Like, m- much of the cast is comedians mm-hmm. um, and people who predominantly do comedy. And it's in, like, this, like, psycho-thriller dark comedy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that adds some levity to a very dark topic, having these really funny people in it. Um, and I think that seeing Carrie Mulligan, she really shined in it. I would love to see her win Best Actress, I think. Yeah. She's not who you'd expect. Yes. And also her character Cassie is not really who you'd expect like she's like the pretty smart girl who's gonna go to med school and she's actually also like doing all these psychotic things that are twisted and playing mind games with people so yeah well it's like you can feel you can feel that she worked for it you know what i mean not that other actors and actresses don't but there are some that it's like oh this is like in your range this is in your yeah this is your type of character and this is not her type of character for her and she nailed it yeah like she there was not one moment i didn't believe her Mm -hmm. i was like oh you are like living this and i think that is what makes it worthy of a win Hmm. what's your rating emma oh um you know i would probably give it an eight Mm. out of Mm ten i am not one to give out high ratings in general (laughs) so uh to me like there's very very few movies that would hit above eight for me and uh this one was i mean i want to watch it again and i really liked it and i keep thinking about it and i think it was done in a really amazing way so Mm. i thought i thought like close to i was i'm gonna say seven and a half or eight it's not the most amazing film that I've ever seen. Like, yeah. I remember a couple years ago, I watched Shape of Water and was just, like, entranced in this film. So, like, there are films like that that, like, capture you. And mm. it's not that, I mean, Shape of Water was incredible. Like, whoever did that was, I think it was Guillermo. No, I don't know. Anyways, um, but, yeah, so it didn't, like, it didn't, like, hit the ball out of the park for me, but... I would say similar to Emma. It's a it's a movie I'd watch again. It's like a fun Friday night girls movie. It's fun like late at night, like get your popcorn out and yell about feminism, which is what we do. So that's yeah. true. That's it's fair. The exact kind it's of like film. a fun girls movie if you're like raging feminist. Yes. Like us. <laughs> yeah. And I think also like very educational and very like important to the topic. It's like the movie highlighted and illuminated very important things without being necessarily about those things. Yeah, like it, had it its wasn't own plot. super preachy, I'd say. Right. Yes. Yeah. Which and I, that is a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't appreciate a good preachy feminist film, but I think the world is the world at large is kind of tired yeah. of that. Yeah. So for something like this, perfect. Yeah. Keep the conversation flowing. Yeah. And that being said, I don't necessarily think this film will take Best Picture, although it was great. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a chance it might snag Best Screenplay just Mm -hmm. because it's so clever. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not expecting it to, like, 
to be a big winner at the at the Oscars this year. Um, especially knowing like what the Oscars favor usually. Like this is not that type of film. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually, actually surprising to me that it's even nominated. I was about to you say, know, I'm like, a little surprised that it was nominated, although it is really good. It's yeah. a little out of the ordinary. I'm um, pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and it's a little bit. It leans more entertainment than like. A tour film, you yeah. know, like yeah, uh, but the Oscars eat up. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay. It's great. Um, you guys can watch Mank. Everyone says it's amazing. I think it's boring. Like you know, like it's just sort of like the type of films that win at the Oscars aren't necessarily the funnest. I would say this yes. is probably going to be the funnest. Yes. Um, all that being said, thank you guys so much for sharing your thoughts about Promising Young Woman. It was really fun to watch it and yes. like research all of the various things that went into the making of it and talk about like the. I don't know the nuances and little things in there that were that were placed and um yeah all of you the oscars are april 25th sunday go watch them get your oscars on it's my favorite thing of the year i was very (laughs) bummed when it got delayed all the way till april so Mm. i'm stoked put on your best ball gown yeah put on your best ball gown (laughs) and um we will see you next week bye uh you can follow us Oh, oh do you yeah. Know? Yeah. No. yeah, you can follow us if you want to at <laughs> Woman Being Podcast on Instagram. Our website is womanbeingcommunity.com. Please leave a review, like, subscribe, share, all those things. I don't know if I missed them, but, you know, like you get the drill. Save our posts. That's supposedly really helpful. Super helpful. Yeah. And Sh- post them to your story. Yeah. Please. Tag your friends. Tag your mom. Tag leave your dog. some great comments and stuff. So, <laughs> anyways, you know the drill. We love you lots. And... Now I will end with have a great week. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. Bye.